um, Professor Tiao, he's the um, Singaporean um, professor, and um, his background is he um, focused on the um, research in educational technology, and he has some work related to MOOCs research. Um, he used to teach at University of Auckland, and then currently he distinguished professor at University of Macau. So today he will share with us about um, the research in MOOCs. And so everyone, please uh, give a warm welcome to Professor Tiao. Right, good morning to one and all. It's in, indeed an honor and a privilege to speak to this group of people. Uh, <coughs> I've never been involved in this, in this meeting, so this is really my first time. Um, and it is heartwarming to hear that a lot of people are trying to do um, things which will benefit education in the ASEAN region. Um, as introduced, I'm from Singapore, so Singapore is part of the ASEAN community and I believe that this effort will um, benefit my <laughs> country of origin as well. So although I'm currently in the University of Macau, uh, I have uh, done work and taught in different countries. So before I go on to this, which is going to be really short, uh, just a preamble in that. Um, what I do is educational research and um, by definition educational research <laughs> which is the best spot can an audio engineer tell me to the left or to the right this is not good okay okay somewhere to the middle but I'm gonna block the PowerPoint so let me try the right this time better good now educational research by definition refers to the fact that whatever research that's generated out of this effort should benefit teaching and learning. So whether you are involved in the technical aspects, the sociological, psychological aspect, the developmental aspects of MOOC, um, what you are doing ultimately, I believe, should benefit teaching and learning. For the teacher to teach something, for the learners to learn something. All right. So this morning, I'm going to share some possibility, some um, ideas, some food for thought. These are by no means exclusive or all-inclusive or comprehensive. There are just some seeds which I hope to sow for purposes of discussion in the next few sessions within this forum. <coughs> And I welcome any comments and, and further ideas to <coughs> excuse me uh, to build on this as well. So in my work, I do research, educational research, like I've defined, all right, but mainly academic educational research. So let me just a disclaimer: academic educational research refers to research which are mainly done within the university context with an express desire for academic dissemination, distribution of knowledge. So we're talking about journal publications, conference presentations, over and above the technical reports which all of you aspire to do, right? So these are some of the possible themes I have looked at in the literature and I've encountered regarding MOOC, development and usage of MOOCs in education. So we're talking about equity issues. How do we ensure people across different demogra demographic profiles have access to MOOC? When you develop your own MOOC, which is at a very high cost, high stakes product, you want to make sure that as many people can access, as many people can use it as possible. So one of the themes is really how do you 
try to make this happen. Equity issues. Should only those living in areas with very advanced technology have access to MOOC? What about those in the rural areas? Should only those that are considered mainstream in their education? What about those in the special education sector? What about those with special needs? How do they access and learn and be educated through your MOOC as well? Pedagogical and economical challenges. Right? Now it is great. We have Japan, we have Korea, we have Thailand. These are largely defined by UNESCO as advanced economy countries. What about the other countries within ASEAN and even beyond that? How do they go about or how can they participate or get involved in this effort, uh, which is obviously significant and very good for teaching and learning, for educating their people. Retention dropout rate, one of the most important considerations in MOOC research. You spend so much effort in developing the product, so much money, so much resources. What you want is as many people to get involved, and not only that, that's only the enrollment part, the retention and the what continuance, the persistent part is also as important throughout the whole spectrum of the learning through your MOOC. So if your classes or your MOOC should last 10 months, then you want 1,000 people to start at the beginning and 1,000 people to end. And reviews of literature in MOOC in the journals have suggested on average, on average, the, num the percentage of university students who are enrolled in MOOC, not in ASEAN but in the Western countries, stands usually between 20 to 30 percent. All right? So if you calculate the return on investment, if you calculate the economic cost, if you calculate the educational cost, 20 to 30 percent may not sound very encouraging. So that's another area of research. Mass versus interactivity. Now in educational technology, when we use ICT, we use technology, one of the affordances in technology that we want to capitalize in the teaching and learning situation is to allow the students to interact with the instructor. Right? All these are informed by psychological theories such as constructivist teaching, such as zone of proximity, so on and so forth. So here you have putting all the resources to develop a product called MOOC and you are aiming at the masses depending on how many instructors you have depending on the class enrollment it is quite reasonable to expect the engagement between in instructors and students it is reasonable to expect the interaction between instructors and students to be not very high so here's another theme to research about. Learners' motivation, which has got a lot to do with enrollment, retention, performance, so on and so forth. Right? Now, the assumption when you create MOOCs is that you want it to succeed. I mean, nobody starts a venture with an idea or a desire to fail. Everybody wants to succeed. In education, whether it is online, e-learning, blended learning, flipped classroom or MOOC, how learners are motivated is always, always an important factor to consider. Yeah? And depending on the mode of teaching, in this case using MOOC, depending on the modes of teaching, learners' motivation will also vary accordingly as well. 
authenticity in assessment. In all learning situations, all teaching situations, assessment is crucial. Otherwise, how do you know that our students have learned? What about assessment in MOOC? How do you ensure students' assessment performance are authentic? In fact, this is not only in MOOC, in educational technology. Top universities all over the world with very, very adequate facilities in research and finance and manpower, they are trying, trying to overcome, overcome this hurdle of online or digital assessment. How do you ensure that the person being assessed is your student? All right? Some breakthroughs are being considered, but up to today, it is still not very comprehensive. And I think this issue concerns the use of MOOC as well. User acceptance. I spend a lot of time doing research in this user acceptance. What are the factors? What determines, what influence students or teachers to engage MOOC in their teaching and learning? MOOC is just one of the modes for teaching and learning. There are many, many other ways to learn and teach. Yeah? So, what do we know about what encourage or motivates them to take up MOOC? Cultural differences. <coughs> Certainly, <coughs> excuse me, one of the major factors because we are talking about inter-country, also intercultural cooperation. All right? Teaching and learning are always, always very influenced by their culture. How a teacher teach, how a student learn are always very, very affected by the culture. And with different countries combining, developing common interests, common goals, all right? shared product, you cannot assume because the product is shared across all countries, therefore they will all be received or they will all be accepted in the same way because there are definitely cultural differences. So I'm going to share some research. I've been involved or I will be involved just to give you a, very, a sample of some ideas of what I meant when I talked about those possible themes. So one of which is teacher's intention to teach using MOOCs. What are the factors that drive or motivate teachers to use MOOC? What does research tell us? It is not easy. It is not an easy thing at all for a university professor high school teacher or elementary teacher to use technology in principle. Technology may be nothing to all of you sitting here, I will assume, because you are heavily involved in this project. If you have a problem with technology, I'll be surprised to see you here. So my assumption, the fact that you are sitting here driving initiatives in using technology for school implies that you are comfortable you believe in technology, you have some knowledge, some skills, and you're experienced in using technology. But it is not the case with many university professors, lecturers, high school teachers, so on and so forth. So there is a real need to try to understand why they do or why they don't. We call these <coughs> enablers and inhibitors, or we call these factors, or we call these drivers, predictors, so on and so forth. Yeah? So, if you want, or I would like to suggest that while you spend so much effort in development of MOOC to be used across different countries, huge, huge effort involved. In parallel, you need to spend certain amount of resources 
to research into why people do and do not use smoke. Otherwise, at the end of the day, when you have developed the most ideal product to be used in Japan, Korea and Thailand, you might find that, hey, it is not well taken out or well accepted and you do not really know why. All right? Teaching remote again, assessment, I was talking about, okay? Can you do teaching and learning without assessment? Maybe in the future, when we are all not around anymore. But for now, for now, educational researchers have suggested that if you want to know the degree or how well your students have learned, your teachers have taught, you need to do assessment, whether it is assessment for learning or assessment of learning, whether it is formal or informal assessment. And for assessment to be informative and meaningful, they must be authentic. Meaning to say, you must be very sure that the people you are assessing are indeed the people who have done the assessment. If you are doing face-to-face -face assessment, no issue at all. I can look at you and I can, okay, stand in front of you and make sure you finish the questionnaire or quiz. But if you are doing through long distance e-learning in which MOOC is a part, an example, you'll be very, very hard, all right? And you do not want to say, or you do not want to take on this attitude that, hey, my class, there are 10,000 people in my MOOC. It's okay if they can get their friends to do the assignments and all of them pass. It's okay. This shouldn't be the correct attitude. You want to make sure your learners who spend the time going through the materials and your instructors who spend the time, the effort, taking your learners through the rounds are the ones who are actually being assessed. So when they get a recognition either in the form of a certificate or nano degree, I know that's what you'll be talking about either today or tomorrow. When you give somebody something, you want it to be authentic and meaningful. What about students? Students. Educational psychology has informed us that in the context of learning, students' characteristics is very, very important. A very important consideration to determine whether students remain engaged or not. So what is engagement? Engagement refers to the state at which students stay on task. All right? Educational psychology. On task means a student spend time doing an activity while pursuing certain educational goals. So when you've developed your MOOC, after some years, after some amount of money, some cost, many, many people involved, you want your students to enroll in your MOOC and stay engaged as much as possible. So what about your students that you can find out to best design your MOOC in such a way that they will stay engaged? In the morning, I heard the report. This is the first time I'm here, remember? Yeah, the first time I'm hearing the report as well. So I hear that there'll be two types of MOOC or two categories of MOOC being developed in as a result of this meeting and gathering. One on data sciences, the other one on tourism and hospitality. Both very, very different types of learning experience in content, in knowledge and skills. All right? So, do we know our students enough in terms of their learning characteristics, learning style preferences, so that when we design them either at the system level at the content level, at the assessment level, that 
these will be maximized or optimized when we roll out the mode. Satisfaction with MOOC learning experiences. Satisfaction as a construct or a psychological trait is very well researched in educational psychology as well. So what do we mean by satisfaction? The state at which a learner believes he or she has taken care of his or her well-being while being engaged in a learning activity. So you want all your learners to be satisfied after they have enrolled and learned from the MOOC you have created. Right? Why? For a few reasons. One, you would have achieved their, help them achieve their educational goals. Two, you can predict what continuance and um, persistence in MOOC enrollment for the future. Three, you can also motivate learners to be your walking newspapers. So what do I mean by walking newspapers? When you go to a restaurant to eat something really nice, just like when I come to Thailand and I eat six different types of dishes, I know what they are and I always eat these when I come to Thailand. So what do I do when I leave Thailand? I tell all my friends to try the six different types of dishes. You do not want to convene a gathering like this to create only one mode and terminate the effort. That's my guess. Unless you're telling me that is the case. I hope it is not because it would be such a pity. You want this group to grow, to involve more countries within ASEAN and beyond in the years to come, and you want the repertoire of the MOOC courses to grow into other than data sciences, tourism and hospitality. You want it to impact in the learning of other content areas. So what we are saying essentially is you will be what, looking at expanding, diversifying and developing more and more MOOCs for different areas. So if somebody, a learner, is satisfied with any one of your MOOCs, then that person is likely to form a very good impression and be likely to quote unquote advertise for your MOOC. This are the types of finding in educational psychology. Incorporating MOOCs with other learning modes. Some people believe that MOOC is but a product, a mean instead of a mode. So what are teaching and learning modes? Blended learning, flipped classroom, e-learning, and MOOC is one of the mean used in any of these teaching modes including face-to-face. -face. That is also a teaching mode. Alright? So, you do not want your product, your modes, to be only used in one solitary teaching mode, which is e-learning. Okay? You want it to be as versatile, as flexible as possible. You want it to be as wide-reaching far-reaching as possible. So how do we go about doing that? I've talked in the last five to ten minutes about the kind of research I've been involved or I will be involved. So let me conclude by sharing some of my observations in terms of the methodology in doing this kind of research. So there are some observations I made cross-sectional versus <coughs> longitudinal. Cross-sectional refers to what? Studying a particular phenomenon by collecting data, um, usually 
only one round of data. Longitudinal research refers to data collection over a certain period of time. All right? So, which one is better, which one is not? That's not the case. It's a matter of which one is more appropriate for researching into issues relating to mold. You need cross-sectional data to inform you of the wide descriptive situation. But if you want more impactful, influential type of research funding, I mean research outcomes, you need to consider longitudinal study, especially when your research is intended to go in parallel or hand in hand with the developmental process. Okay, so this is part developmental research and part um, empirical research. Survey versus experimental. Survey means you just collect the data, mass data. And a lot of people who does research into MOOC are very excited. Why? Because there's such thing called big data. Computer scientists, people in ICT, they're very familiar. You just mine the data, you do analysis, and you can actually do it quite easily and quite quickly without much manpower. So that is type of survey data. Yeah, but from the educational point of view, from the educational psychological point of view, experimental data, experimental studies may be just as important. Why? Because it allows you to control for various conditions so as to inform you on specific issues you want to deal with more. Take for example, if you are in the process of developing the system architecture where you have various options, ex an experimental study will be highly desirable to inform you of this matter. People who develop content, people who develop the, um, the web page, all right, also may find useful to learn from experimental data because it allows you control and contrast. Mono versus cross-cultural. In the academic literature, monocultural studies are not as welcome enthusiastically as those in cross-culture. One of the reasons is because um, research in education has been so pervasive and it has grown so much exponentially over the last few years that what is happening in one culture, today it is very difficult, very difficult to generalize into another culture. And you are all, or particularly this forum, is at a very high advantage because you come from different culture. And if you do want to do cross-cultural study, this can be easily facilitated because of your presence in this gathering. Unitary versus comparative studies. Unitary refers to something that happens in one region, one country, or one university. Right? Today, people, or rather uh, policymakers, welcome, welcome comparative studies because most researchers, most academics, they are quite familiar with their own environment, own setting. So how do they grow and how do they improve and how do they contribute to the scholarly community more? That is one way by understanding and comparing similarities and differences from the other cultures. So this is what we mean by comparative studies. Again, I think this gathering is a good way moving forward because all of you here represent 
different cultures, different nationality, different educational system, and you are in the best position to conduct any comparative studies if desired. And I hope I've given you a snippet, a, a very quick, I wouldn't say overview, sample of what some of the research themes might be considered by this meeting uh, in moving forward and some of the issues relating to methodology. And before I forget, the very first point about quantitative and qualitative research. Those of you who are doing, who have done educational research, you know these are two main schools of thought. Yeah? And in many universities, many scholars they always debate, and the debate has not ended today. Right? The debate ensues as to which one is the better methodology. But in my view, they are different methodology. They serve to complement each other, and they serve to answer different research questions. And my belief is we need two to work hand in hand to get a more holistic picture of the issues that we want to consider. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Theo, for the food for thought uh, from the researcher perspective toward the MOOC's research. Um, Professor Theo will be with us all through, like, uh, on both day today and tomorrow. So I'm sure that he. Um, welcome for further discussion, right? Related to the research study. So welcome anyone if you would like to <laughs> to have a further discussion with him, like in terms of the MOOC research. Um, and um, one more thing that uh, I forgot to introduce him earlier, and I just checked his um, CV and found that um, the updated information of him is that right now he has. Um,